Welcome into the KSO Sunday show. This is Mason Voth with KSU for- fan Drew Galloway, and we are back for, uh, you know, a little bit of fun at the end, which we'll get to. Uh, we had a very obvious winner last week, pretty decisive uh, when we did our draft. So uh, tip of the hat to Drew for uh, a one and zero start there. I think the way that I'm going to have to do this, though, is, you know, somebody, whoever gets second probably doesn't deserve to be knocked for a loss. So I think we're just going to give out points. So, <laughs> Drew, it, you get you get all three points there. It's like you just won a soccer game. You you got all three. You got the result you wanted. Uh, fan will get two, and I'll just get a, a lowly one for uh, my last place finish because uh, Drew dominated last week. We knew this uh, after it was done. So that's all the fun stuff. We'll get into it a little bit deeper at the end of the show. But before we get to that, there are a couple of things on the front of Transfer Portal and Basketball and then spring football wrapping up for K-State. So, Drew, I'll let you add a little recruiting flair into this, and we'll have a a deeper recruiting update uh, when we get to next week. But uh, anything you can tell us about now that spring is winding down for K-State on what the recruiting situation looks like? And uh, I know that we have one person that directly talks to us sometimes, that they were getting antsy about only having one commit today. Uh, and that you just saw another in-state guy end up going to Nebraska and Bryson Hayes. So what is the recruiting situation looking like for K-State over the next couple of weeks? Uh, I think I wouldn't necessarily say antsy is the right word, but it's more of just more of the same, just patience right now. Because, uh, I mean, you look around and the 2025 class as a whole across the country right now has been pretty slow about committing other places. I know that Bryson Hayes committed to Nebraska earlier this afternoon. I, I don't know how big of a loss that is for K State, or even to be honest, if K State is like overly heartbroken that he chose Nebraska. I just never got the sense after he came to the K State camp and got the offer that the two were ever really on the same page at the same time. So you kind of move forward and go from there. But it's. A little bit more of the same, just a, a big waiting game. I mean, they, they're at one commit right now, but if you look back in the 2023 class, I think it was around this time where they got their second and third. I believe that last year they were only about at two or three at this point. So there's no need to really panic because kids are just kind of taking their time and they're in the game for a lot of their guys that they really want. And I think at the end of the day, that's all you can really ask for at this point. Okay, well, then that's probably good to give people at least a little bit of a, an avenue to kind of slow down. Uh, coming out of spring now for K-State football, we've gotten to hear everything and, and see everything that's come about. Fan, you're you're not in this on the, the every day with us, so I'm not hitting you up, you know, random times to hop on here and talk about it. From, you know, a little bit more on the outside of everything, what has your perception been of, some of the changes around K-State football this coming year with obviously Matt Wells being in the fold and then just overall where this would compare to momentum and and just how you feel heading into a season compared to previous springs for K-State football. Yeah, that's, I I think I look, um, number one is just kind of the comments of the day from Kleiman and and some of them from Wells about possible tweaks in the offense and changes and what that, what do they mean by simplification? Um, I'm sure some of that was uh, Colin Klein probably had some of the Snyder tendencies to put in lots of options on not only r- routes in the passing game, but also in the running game. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see what distinctions and, and simplicities Wells will actually bring. Um, Wells has always been a H-back tight end kind of guy, and, and that was something he touted even when he got the Texas Tech job, and he's talked about it here. So I think we'll see some of those – similarities but uh i'm curious just to see the 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 mix of zone power scheme if that changes much because uh k-state was pretty diverse under both messingham and klein and in the the running schemes that they ran um then just uh, defensively um you know it sounds like positive things about safeties which i think some people were worried about going into the spring and and even the defensive line um some positive comments um that we've seen and, and DY has been pretty positive on, on some of those things on, on KSO. So um, if the defense can improve, cause I think the defense was the weakness last year. Um, I, I do think um, I've seen some people 
hyping the offense and kind of downplaying Colin Klein and what they did. The last two years, offense was pretty darn good. And by my numbers, uh, which I think are pretty good, the best in the big in Big 12 games only, the best in the league the last two years in points per drive, which, you know, that's I was thinking that we're going to be a 3.1, 3.2 points per drive team all of a sudden when that's what we did the last two years and get better than that. I don't know. Like, I think the, the key is going to be getting better on defense because that, to me, was our weakness last year and and even some in the Big 12 championship year uh, compared to the offense. So, you know, we had some bad defense offensive games as well. Oklahoma State last year stands out as a, as a particularly bad one, but the defensive lapses were more glaring, especially looking at, like, Iowa State last year and things like that. So those are the things that I'm going to be looking for going into the next season and, and things that kind of hit my mind as, as I read about what happened in the spring since we don't get to see much. All right, Drew, for you, I'll, I'll simplify the, the question a little bit more, and you just have to give me a, a, a yes or no answer, basically. Are your expectations for this K-State team this year to achieve more than what last year's team did? I mean, a nine-win team, eight and four in the regular season, and obviously we know fans said, hey, the offense, even though you, it, people would get upset at times, was still pretty good, and the defense maybe could have used some work. But we, we know in the end the defense was most of the time did their job except for the Iowa State game. Uh, where, where would you go with this? I would say that the expectation is to win more than nine games. And I, I think that when you have a special talent at quarterback, like you have to maximize that at the college level because you only get sometimes you only get three years out of the quarterback that comes in. So if if you get a full season of Avery Johnson, like you have to maximize your uh, ceiling and achieve your ceiling and win as many games as possible. So I, I think that the expectation has to be winning at, at least nine games in the regular season. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you. And we also know that the way that the schedule works out, uh, you lose Texas and Oklahoma from the Big 12 rotation. You would think, okay, you should probably come through and, and have a little bit of an easier stretch, especially since you don't have to play Utah, uh, who will, will be a, a team that sticks out there. So we'll see how it goes. But I, I, I figured that we would all probably be in agreement that this team should win at least nine in the regular season next season, which at the end of the day, the team the past year probably should have done that. But they, you know, missed a pretty golden opportunity there to close things out with Iowa State. So uh, that's that's the little bit there is on spring football. We'll have more on that throughout the week, especially at the start of it. D.Y. and I will co- kind of go over. Uh, what Chris Kleiman had to say to finish things out. Also talked a little bit about Avery Johnson and uh, everything else going on from that. So let's shift gears to the transfer portal in basketball, which is probably the most uh, talked about thing on KSO right now because it's just nonstop. You never know when something's going to happen in the portal. So people are on pins and needles. Before we dive into guys that it seems like K-State is seriously gunning for here, uh, let's have the Mark Mitchell conversation because that's been a hot topic over there. So I'll let each of you kind of give your piece on uh, Mark Mitchell, who appears to have a lot of interest in K-State. K-State at this point in time doesn't seem to want to play ball, given all the, the circumstances that would be at play there. Uh, if the the opportunity presented itself and things worked out, obviously with the NIL that a guy like Mark Mitchell wants and fit in what makes K-State an NCAA tournament team next year, should they take that opportunity or continue to just say, nope, we're good, we're going to find other options? I'll, I'll let I'll let Fan go first here because he's more rational than most people on this topic, I would say. <laughs> it, it's it's an intriguing conversation because, you know, you, you it, when you first glance at it, you see a, a kid coming from Duke, started multiple games, uh, was a top 30, top 25 recruit out of high school from nearby and – apparently from everything uh, that we see out there wants to come to K state and so much so that a guy from Arizona put the crystal ball on him, um, which is weird. So that, that part, you know, and, and you, you would think at K state, if you have a portal guy that uh, interested in you, you would just latch onto it and take him. So I, I, so I get the, the fan excitement from that perspective, but, you also have to have the right fit. Um, 
And if you have too much roster overlap, I think we saw that a little bit last year. Um, I think this guy, Mitchell, can can play. I think he's really good. He had 50 dunks last year, which is super impressive. Clearly, he's getting to the rim. He can shoot it a little bit. You know, he started the season like one of 20 from three and then shot decent from the rest of the year. Doesn't shoot very many threes per game. Um, but he played on a Duke team that he was, what, the fourth or fifth option um, on a pretty good Elite Eight team. Um, so usually a guy in that situation that's leaving is probably looking to be the first or second option on wherever he lands. And I'm not sure K-State provides that. And I'm not sure K-State is going to play first or second tier NIL money to, to Mark Mitchell, which may be part of the hangout. And then you have the overlap. You already have uh, David Gasson. You have Buddy Mid- – Buddy, uh, why am I forgetting Buddy? Buddy Rich, yeah, yeah. Buddy Rich. Well, yeah, to, to that point real quick, like you already have guys that aren't primary ball handlers that yes. are you know, more in that traditional just forward role that can't shoot the ball and have yeah. athleticism and can do things that the coaching staff wants. And Mark Mitchell would just be another one of those guys. Like yes. I think in some people's minds, what they're thinking of with Mark Mitchell is, okay, well, you get a guy that has – he was a five-star at one point. He's from close by. Why would you turn that away? Like, he was a five-star coming out of high school. He's not a five-star coming out of Duke now, the way that things are mm-hmm. set up. And I, like I said on the boards today, and this is not just – this is for anybody that is fully on board with this. Like, if you were frustrated with what K-State got from Arthur Kaluma last year, once you actually saw Mark Mitchell on the floor, you'd be ripping your hair out because he's not going to shoot it as well as Kaluma did – and I don't think that his actual – and I know Kaluma struggled with this at times, but like I don't think Mark Mitchell's own creation game is as good as Kaluma's even is. So I don't really know what the purpose there is. Like If this gets down to the point where K-State has you know four or five open spots and they, they're looking for somebody to fill out towards the end and he's still there and, and everything aligns, he's not a bad guy to take a flyer on, but you don't need to do it on April 14th in the process Mm -hmm. when there are other good options out there and you know that there are a handful of guys that you really want that fit what you need a whole lot better to be a good basketball team next season. Yeah, I agree completely with that. I mean, I think the biggest thing is the overlap of three other players on the roster, basically, and almost four if Kaluma comes back, even though Kaluma can shoot it. Um, And I don't know that you want to have that, especially when you want to add, I think the staff obviously wants to add a true five, uh, more of a, yeah. a, a true five spot, which they probably need on this roster to go with the three guys that are kind of fours and only fours really can't play the three that much. And, you know, I think D- David Gasson can slide over and play the five a little bit, but I don't see Taj Manning or Buddy, R- Buddy Rich doing that. So yeah, I, I, you just have a log jam there. And, and I think it just doesn't make sense. And I think probably the demand for NIL from Mitchell is probably, a little bit more than what we want to pay considering where he'll be on this roster. Well, and real quick, I'll let Drew go after this, but I think that if David Gasson had moved on, so you don't have yeah. Gasson on the roster, I think most people would be in agreement that, Hey, yeah, do go get Mark Mitchell again. If the, the other circumstances that play into transfer portal recruiting works out now, because you, you can't, like you're saying, Finn, you can't have that many guys that have the same deficiency and expect for the offense to work because what we know led to K-State struggles last year was the offensive scheme. And at times they got a lot of open looks, but they just didn't have a, a many guys that could make them from outside. You can't keep throwing more guys that can't shoot together. It's going to lead to disaster. So I think that that's one of those areas where if the circumstances were different, the Mark Mitchell thing makes a ton of sense, but they're not. And you already have a guy in David Gasson that you trust the staff likes and you know what you're going to get out of him. Mark Mitchell, to some extent, is still a little bit of an unknown, even if you do think, hey, you can still project some good things from what he did at Duke. So uh, that will be uh, what I say on it. Drew, your thoughts on the the Mark Mitchell situation that everybody's really hot on the trails of. Uh, I was the first one to be kind of – to really push back on the Mark Mitchell stuff because I, I just yeah. – I, I don't love him as a player. I don't love the fit. I saw that we have – We've had a couple of people on the board say, like, why would you turn away this guy? Like, he could be an NBA guy. And, like, my my rebuttal would be if he's an NBA guy, he would already be gone. Like, this draft class is terrible in the NBA this year, and he's not on any 
top like 50 boards right now. So he's not an NBA guy right now. And if he was an NBA guy, I'd be okay with taking him and moving and trying to figure out the pieces, but he's just not. And if you take away Duke, you take away Kansas city. I don't think that people really care about this recruitment as much. If he was from like Nevada and went to school in like Texas, nobody cares. So yeah. I, I think that I think that the local tie really kind of plays into why everybody has been such a hot button topic on it. But he's not a good shooter. He's a slightly better three point shooter than David Gasson, but a much worse two point shooter. So I, I just I don't see where he would fit or why you would even think about wanting somebody like him on this roster when you already have that with David Gasson. Yep. No, makes, makes a lot of sense. All right. Uh, I was going to say, let's move on to guys that we know are still in play for K state, but real quick, it was mentioned about, you know, the asking price of Mark Mitchell and that's been thrown out there by people about, Hey, it might be a little bit higher than what somebody that has done what he's done has commanded. Uh, it, I mean, Michael Brown Jones is a guy that K state misses out on, on Ole Miss uh, up to Ole Miss. It seems like that might be something where, that's at play. And I think that I just say that to give people perspective in all this is that K State, we learned this last year. I, do, are they a better team with Joe Toussaint on the team last year? Probably so. But again, that comes before knowing that Quest Glover was going to be hurt. I mean, we didn't even know Quest Glover was going to be on the team when the Toussaint stuff went down. Obviously, you don't have Naquan Tomlin. Like, there were a lot of things at play there uh, last year that, you know, whatever. But Texas Tech, we know, ponied up at the end, and they were they were going to make it a little bit of a bidding war. And K State, I think they have a pretty r- realistic expectation of what guys are worth, or at least what guys are worth to their system. And they're not going to, you know, overpromise or waste whatever they have in the tank for how recruiting works these days on guys that might make your team better. They want to make sure that they're they're saving it for the guys that they know will make their team better, which is why they've already gotten Doug McDaniel and why they're still in play for a couple of guys that we'll get ready to talk about right now. So uh, let's start with C.J. Jones out of UIC, Illinois, Chicago, for those that aren't aware of the Flames, who are now in the Missouri Valley. Um, I guess they've they've been there for a while at this point. But C.J. Jones, a little bit of an uptick. He was originally committed to Missouri out of high school, ended up not going there. So he's been at UIC uh, the last two years. He's got two years left to play. Shot close to 38% from three this past season. Drew, uh, I think you like C.J. Jones. So what do you think of the Cats and their chances to land him? Yeah, I think that K-State has a really, really good shot at landing him. They've really held off some top programs to get to this point where you feel really comfortable about uh, K-State getting C.J. Jones. And, And I just think that his fit on the roster, like we just talked about how we thought that Mark Mitchell was a bad fit. C.J. Jones is a really good fit because he's a taller, lengthy guard, forward, wing, whatever you want to call him, because he's around 6'5", 6'6", has pretty long arms, is a shot creator and shot maker, which I think that's kind of the thing that K-State was missing a lot last year. And to just kind of show how good I think that he can be is that I think that he had a game with like 14 assists earlier this or this past season with uh, Illinois Chicago and has a really high assist rate. He does have a a bit of a turnover issue, but I think some of that was just usage at Illinois Chicago and you can maybe cut that down a little bit, but you're adding a really good passer who has potential to be a really good defender and you needed somebody on the perimeter that had the length that he does with Doug McDaniel and day day AMs being on the smaller side. Yeah, yeah, fan, I, yeah, I'll let you go on, on CJ here because you'll yeah, have I, insights. I think he's a high level for his, you know, coming from the Mo Valley. I mean, that's, I think, the number 10 conference last year. So it's not some super low major that's, you know, there's what, 30 conferences out there. So it's in the top third of the country. Not a multi bid league, but a pretty good one. Um, close to a two big league this year. Um, I agree with Drew, can shoot the three, and the assist numbers are things that stick out to me. Uh, he wasn't very good from two. He wasn't very good at the rim for the season. 
Uh, he also shot a lot of two-point jump shots. I think almost 35% of his shots this year were two-point jump shots, which I'm not a big fan of, as, as you've heard all year. Um, but he wasn't really good at the rim of the year either, like 49% at the rim this year. So, but but I think, you know, usually guys, when they come here, shoot better at the rim than where they, wherever they were at. I think that's part of the, the, the Tang system um, that they generate better shots for you at the rim and reduce the amount of two-point jump shots you're going to take just because that's our system. So uh, I'm really intrigued by the 37%, 38% three-point shooting, only two and a half a game, but, you know, that's a pretty good rate. Um, And he shot 34% as a freshman at 2.3 three-point attempts per game. So I like this. I like all that put together. Wasn't super efficient, um, mainly because he was so bad on twos, really, compared to uh, threes. The three-point shooting was good enough. Not a great free throw shooter as well, so um, that's something you'd like to see improve. But I think he fits well just because of what Drew said, a tall two-guard slash three that can play uh, a couple of different positions and give you some options on the perimeter. Okay, makes sense. All right, moving on now. Uh, we go to – now, is, do we think it's – is it Baba or Baba Miller? I have not paid – I have not bothered to let, go back and watch Florida State games with sound. Uh, to to know the actual pronunciation there, and Florida State didn't put it on their their website. But this is a, an intriguing look for K State, who we seem to know they they want him pretty good. He's he's just coming off a sophomore season at Florida State. He's got a lot of length. He's got some good mo- mobility to his game, and he's not. I mean, even though he's six eleven, he's not like a traditional big. He I don't think anybody can be Naquan Tomlin, but he does have some flashes in there where you see why this staff would like a guy like this. Uh, so, Fan, I'll let you go first here. Do you like Miller as a fit for K-State if they're able to go out and get him? Yeah, I, I love him as a fit, actually. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about MBJ and losing him, but there's some ways I like Miller better just because I think Miller can play three through five for you. And I think he is not maybe quite Naquan Tomlin yet, but I think he's Tomlin-esque in the way he plays. Um, He can shoot it, you know, 40% of his shots were threes, and he made 29%, so it wasn't a great level. It's kind of reminds you of Tomlin his first year here as far as making him, but I like that he's a guy that has that ability to shoot it. He's a really good rebounder. He's really good at the rim. Um, Had a good amount of success playing internationally for Spain, who won the FIBA championship at his level last year, last summer. Uh, I think K-State kind of overlapped on their trip with that FIBA tournament. So um, I think that's a positive for me. I also think, you know, he he was slowed down a little bit in his development because he lost 16, first 16 games as his freshman year because – this is crazy in the NIL world. He got paid three grand to play in some tournament and his parents paid it back. And the NCAA still suspended him half the season. Like, come on, give me a break in the NIL world. This is what gets you in yeah. trouble. It's just dumb. And so I think that slowed him down. I also think Leonard Hamilton might be at the end of his career. Like I think he might yeah. be in that position where he's a coach that's 75 years old, has coached a ton, had a great amount of success for at Florida state, but, really has not been very good the last three seasons. So uh, I think that plays into it. Uh, I think he would be a good fit here. I think, you know, you you have some international flair already with David Gasson on the team, even though they're not both Spanish. I mean, but they're both European. I think that helps you out, hopefully, and you're recruiting him. But I, I think he'd be a great fit. I think he's got a high ceiling. I think he probably might have a higher, higher ceiling than MBJ who was just going to be here one year anyway. So that's my take on looking at him. And I'm super excited. The more I looked at him, the more excited I got. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I I really like C.J. Jones, but I think that Bob Miller is probably second for me in my like want list. Like you already got Doug McDaniel, who is my number one. Now Bob Miller probably number two because I just think that he has – he just oozes potential kind of like Naquan Tomlin did when he got to K-State where he's a long, lengthy, really skinny kid that is super athletic, can shoot a little bit, can do a little bit of everything. Uh, And again, not to just 
fire shots at uh, Mark Mitchell. But, oh, no. <laughs> but, but, but Baba Miller actually is on NBA draft boards and is a top yeah. 50 consensus prospect in the NBA draft this year. It's like NBA guys are thinking about him, and that, I think that's, again, good enough for me to be like, okay, like we can m- just take him and figure out the rest and see how it fits. But I really like his fit because he is as close to Naquan Tomlin as you could probably get. And, and I can see why the staff likes him. And he is good at the rim. He's good in transition. Uh, I'm really intrigued to see if if he gets to K-State, can he really take the next jump from three? Because that, that would be the next thing. You know, it would make K-State even more dangerous next year is if he can take that small jump like 32%, 33%. Well, and I here's I think that when you you talk about comparing Miller to Mitchell, Miller has a few more inches on um, Mitchell in height, but also the thing about being on NBA draft boards that's not insignificant because those guys. I mean, you look at a guy like Zach Eady. Now, this is a weak NBA draft year, so uh, he's he is I think going to end up going in the first round, but. You look at a guy like that, he's not getting like he's not going to play real NBA minutes ever. And I don't think he's thought of in that way. And there have been other bigs and, and guys like that in college b- basketball that it, it just doesn't translate because you have to have a couple of things. And one of it is being projected to where, okay, we can develop this shot. I think that is something that they think can happen with Miller, uh, similar to Naquan Tomlin. And then obviously, uh, we've already talked about the creation ability like that is there. He's just a little bit more shifty and, and nifty than what Mitchell is. Mitchell, to me, comes across as being just a lot more straightforward and and how he's going to try and get it done. So I, I really like Miller. I, I think that that's one that like uh, probably to me, I, I would be more on board with that being my number one option than even Jones right now. Even though you need a guy like Jones, I think the upside that Miller has is probably greater uh, than what Jones is, because like there's a a realistic chance that you know, if if Miller does come to K State, we're talking next season, him being one of the better players on the team, um, and Jones, I just think will always have a role to serve, which isn't a, a bad thing at all. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see how it all works out for K State. But those are guys that uh, the Wildcats have obviously uh, had around and and are very much uh, in the middle of trying to land. So. We'll see how it goes, where everything else kind of progresses from here and uh, what the next portal moves are. And we'll have all that updated throughout uh, the next week, months, however long it takes over at KSO. So head over to On3 and find it. Uh, Any other thoughts on the portal or anything else K-State related before we get on to having some fun and then getting out of here on an abbreviated Sunday show with the Royals and Masters going? Uh, Shot blocking is kind of overrated a little bit, but Bob Miller. Great point. Great shot blocker, though. Defense yeah. in general, overrated. Defense in general. <laughs> hey, it's I, I sent the sent you the stats from Twitter. I mean, it's yep proven proven right. facts. Now, the only thing I'll say is, um, you know, <laughs> lots of people still freaking out about the portal and the pace of K State and where we're at, and you know, just to I mean, to be fair, we got a week, week and a half head start because we weren't playing as long this year. But K State already has more visitors than they had at at this time last year. We had zero portal visitors, we had zero portal commits, and we have four portal vi- visitors so far. And and it sounds like a good chance we'll have a second portal commit, you know, soon. So um, just keep in mind where we're at in the portal. I think I think the staff did so, le- learn some lessons of of moving a little quicker. Uh, with good patience and knowing you're going to lose some battles. Um, if we get to July again and we're still two spots open, then I'll be a little more concerned. But we're not even close to that at this point. So I, I think our portal movement so far, while you, you hate losing a guy that you thought you had a really good chance of an MBJ, you still feel pretty good about where we're at, in my opinion. Yep, makes sense. Uh, all right, well, let's roll on here. Uh, here's how we're going to do this. So Drew won our um, our draft last week. He came through, had a great team. Uh, nobody's going to deny that with his just random K-State basketball players. 
So this week, kind of in the same vein, but some of these guys you may have heard of at one point or another, we are going to go ahead and we are going to talk about uh, because spring football just wrapped up and every year it seems like, hey, there's this guy that's like this wizard of spring ball and there's a lot of buzz about him. We're going to get in and talk about these guys. So the the criteria basically is you just have to select somebody that stands out as at one point they were getting big time off season or spring buzz, but that's all they ever did at K-State. They never really accomplished a ton on the field and their accolades that they racked up in people's heads in the spring is greater than what they ever actually did, uh, you know, come the fall. So because Drew won last week and he's now got the, the lead the first time we did it, um, he's not going to get to pick how he picks today. Uh, <laughs> We're going to do this to where whoever gets last the week prior. Actually, let's not do it the last the week prior. We're going to do whoever's in last in the standings gets to pick their positioning. So I will take the second pick, which means I'll always be sandwiched in the middle this week. Fans, since you're in second, you either get to choose if you want the first pick or you get the back-to-back with three and four. So I'll leave that up to you since uh, the, the pick is yours now. I'll take the first pick. Okay. All right. So, Drew, uh, I got where I wanted. So, we're we're, we're feeling great over I here. I mean, it, it that can be a that can be a good spot. So, I'm just uh writing down now so I don't confuse anything. As uh Drew is aware, sometimes when I'm doing all these different things, I can get very confused. So, all right. Uh fan, you can start us off here. I'll uh get everything rocking and rolling so I can I can show it on the the screen and everything, but Uh, You can start with your first pick in the off-season slash spring ball legends draft that we are doing here. I'm going to go with, uh, I think, one of the most hyped recruits K-State has gotten that didn't do much. That did. I I did. The first one is a guy that was on the roster, Marvin Simmons, linebacker from the early 2000s, um, was super highly touted coming out of Compton. Juco um, had a cup of coffee, played a few games. I think he had one game with some tackles, had some good spring games. But Sounds like he did a lot there. Was, was not was, was not what he was hyped to be coming out of Compton Junior College. Okay. Yeah, that no, that seems like a good one, and I think that's honestly probably a good descriptor of what these guys are if you're saying he did play in some games and had a couple tackles. Uh, that's probably – a good place to start. I uh, Now it's my pick, and I think this is the guy that he stands out to me as like the all-time, just felt like you heard his name constantly and nothing happened. And we've already discussed before we started that we might hear uh, one position more than another. I think I have to go with Carlos Strickland oh. uh, with this pick because I, I think that's the one where it seems like just relentlessly you heard about Carlos Strickland and people were excited about him. Uh, transfer from Cal, and he never did anything. And I couldn't even – I don't know that he even caught a ball in a a real game or even played in a real game. So I'm taking Carlos Strickland with my first pick. Not to be confused with Trevastin Taylor. (laughs) Are you going to take Seabass? My first pick, uh, again, the one position group I think really is going to dominate this draft – uh, mine, it's uh, off the field reasons or why. He oh, I know who this is going to be. Uh, uh, my first pick is going to be Hunter Ryzen. Oh, wow. Okay. I did not expect Hunter Ryzen. Uh, uh, Hunter Ryzen was uh, really hyped up. I think it was uh, the the, yeah. the first spring of climbing. Yes, it was. And then he got kicked off the team for beating his girlfriend up that was on the women's basketball team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't want locker room problems on my team. So I, I'm, well, I'm trying to run a clean program over here. I'm not. So, okay. Uh, not uh, who I thought you were going to go with there, by the way, he wasn't even on my, on my, my big board that he I was had. The, he was the first person I thought of when you, when you said this, uh, that's a then, good one though. Then, uh, for pick two, this is where the back-to-back hurts because I, I, I want to get out in front of this, but I think that this might be a little bit of a reach at, 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 in, in round two. But we're going to go with John Holcomb. Oh, Hol- Holcomb mania. Okay, I like it. The, the dunk video went viral. 
<laughs> then I'm not sure if he ever played a game. He might have played one game at tight end and then was like, this is it for me. Uh, he played yeah. the Oklahoma State game uh, the the year that, that Skyler was hurt. And so Will started and then Will got hurt early on. And then Jaron Lewis had to play most of the game at quarterback. Uh, yeah, John Holcomb. So we did, we had a stretch there where on the game we had, I don't know why the Skyler 316 thing came about, but we did that probably because of Mitch and wrestling. So then we had John Holcomb there and we did Holcomb mania. And so we had made like graphics that m mimicked the Austin 316 and Holcomb mania stuff. And I had those and we tweeted them out and John Holcomb's dad for who knows how long took the Hulkamania that I made and it was like his profile picture on social media <laughs> and you would see it pop up from time to time and you're like, well, that looks familiar. I know what that is because I made it. Uh, so that John Holcomb is a, that is a great pick that tip of the tip of the hat to you, Drew. I, nobody's better at this than Drew Calloway and he's only made seven Good. picks. Good. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go down my list now. And uh, I think I got to go back to receiver and, this is a my guy here um, because, you know, I, I jokingly refer to him as Megatron sometimes. I think Cole Manbeck and I share a love for him, but Shabastin Taylor has to be on this so, list here. You just pick both Shabastin Taylors? It, pretty <laughs> much, pretty much, yeah. That's, that's a good way of looking at it. So, I mean, I look like a genius for loving him. That Texas <laughs> Tech game 2019, I was like, you know what? There might be something to yeah. this year. Uh, there turned out to not be anything to it there, but that is uh, that is my pick. So back to back now for fan, as I have both uh, C wide receivers taken. I'm going to go with the, a, a Kansan, Bryce Brown. Mm, good one. Nice. That's a great one. Nice career at K State with the uh, keeping up our draft pick streak, even though he played like four downs and gave up a sack transferred from Tennessee was and fumbled against, uh, fumbled, yeah. against Eastern Kentucky. Yeah. So he, he was, he was the one that really stood out to me. Um, yeah. and then I'm going to go with one that I don't believe ever made it to campus quarterback, Nick Patton from Winfield, Kansas was a four-star dual threat quarterback around Oh three Oh four was it intended, was expected to be the next, uh, L Roberson, uh, did not turn out to work out for the cats on that one, Nick Patton. Okay, that's a that's a good one there. But as a as an ABCTL Division three guy, you just can't ever trust the Winfield Vikings. <laughs> I don't know that Winfield's ever done anything productive uh, with themselves. So it is what it is. But uh, those are those are good ones. Bryce Brown was certainly a guy that was on my list here. Now this is where I kind of get into some guys that. Um, people might have a little bit more of a debate for, but I actually think I'm going to go, I'm going to keep going with wide receivers that their name starts with a C. <laughs> and I thought this is where Drew was going to go. And I think this one hurts even more knowing what he was able to accomplish once he left K State. But I'm going to go with Corey Sutton. Ooh, that's another so, good one. That was when Drew said that he had off the field issues, I thought uh, he was referencing. Bill Snyder basically just publicly like, yeah, this guy uh, might have a marijuana uh, things going on with him. No, uh, I'm taking Corey Sutton with that pick because you think about it then, Corey Sutton went off on to be pretty successful at App State and uh, K-State certainly could have used a receiver that was good at any point in his life uh, on some of those teams at the end of Snyder. So uh, Corey Sutton and I'm just, I'm loaded here with wide receivers. So uh, now Drew yeah. gets back-to-back -back picks after. God, can you fill out a whole roster, please, instead of just loading up at one position? I yeah, mean... well, I, I do have a couple quarterbacks on my <laughs> roster uh, or my big board left. No more C names, though. So oh, that's I'm, tough. Yeah. Uh, for my uh, third-round pick, we're going to go uh, a little bit of a throwback name, but it was the name that I thought of actually like while we were recording. Uh, Terrell Clink Scales, mm -hmm. uh, highly, highly rated Juco defensive tackle. I genuinely don't think he ever played a game. I remember that K-State beat out Nebraska at the end of Snyder Forum. 
and Nebraska fans like tried to play it off, and then Nebraska fans ended up being right because he sucked. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, I think they they won out, even if they they weren't right at the time. Uh, they were probably right, saying, "Hey, no, we didn't want that guy." Uh, and then uh, to start the fourth round, we're uh, yeah, I'm gonna shift to a quarterback slash athlete and a uh, Sammy Lamar. Oh, that, the, uh, yeah. the secret Sammy package that we never got to actually see. Yeah, I I I was a Samuel Lemur guy. There's no doubt about it. I he was a god on NCAA football. <laughs> I was gonna say I loved using him in NCAA football. So uh, that's that's a good pick, and I'm sure a lot of people out there are, are loving that up. Um, I don't. I, I mean, I want to throw this out here, and maybe we could save it for after. But you know, anybody's open to use it because I'm not gonna take it. But I don't think Daniel Sam's works for what we're doing here, right? No. Mm-hmm. Because uh, he, we saw him in games, and people still were like, mainly just John Kurtz, but they were like, <laughs> you know, he is everything we've heard he is, and then some. I, I like the somebody, but mostly John Kurtz. It does. I mean, it does crack me up with how much John talks about liking him and everything. I'm like, man, I, I felt the same way. Except the difference was when John loved him. John was like 22 years old and in college and should have known better. I was like an eighth grader and i was like yeah i love this guy like this is what we this is what we need uh so yeah another god on ncaa football yep if, if you have any movement at all you're, uh, <laughs> you're pretty good in that game all right back to me this is where i start to to question some things uh surprisingly the only name that's been stolen from me is bryce brown so i feel good about that i am going to take reggie walker 2.0 so not I don't want to. I'm not going to say that because that would sound mean. I was going to say not good Reggie Walker, but I'm going to take Reggie Walker under uh, the you know the, in the last five years. So that not, is my Reggie Walker pick. I was going to say not the NFL Reggie Walker, but no. <laughs> but that doesn't work. Reggie Walker, uh, the, the one we're talking about, he did get a little bit of time in the NFL. So I am taking Reggie Walker there. Uh, because that feels like one, and there are a lot of defensive ends. I think that's probably the second most populated category where you can look at and say, oh, that guy had a ton of buzz and nothing good came out of it. Um, and Reggie Walker was still fine and, and productive for K-State, but he just didn't – he never did it for me. And It always seemed like uh, the the buzz outweighed what he was going to accomplish on the field. So Reggie Walker is my pick, and now – a uh, fan can round out his roster here with picks four and five, which Drew's talking about balance. He has two quarterbacks. We all know if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. John was um, the tight end. He was a tight end. That's right. Uh, Jamie Lamar, if you I, if you ask John Col- Holcomb Lamar. what he was, he would not say that he was a tight end. I will tell you that. Uh, well, Sammy can play somewhere else. Yeah, that's true. All right, uh, fan, you get your back to back here to round out your roster. A lot of good names still out there. Yeah, I'm, my next pick, I'm going to go with one of the another one of the greatest recruits in K State history that did nothing. Offensive tackle Chris Bogus, who not only didn't do anything, he played a little bit, but he eventually stole two signed baseballs from Bill Snyder at his house during some. <laughs> team party and got arrested for felony theft because they were like signed by Mickey Mantle and some other famous New York Yankees. So not only did he not play very well and live up to his hype, he stole from his coach signed <laughs> major league baseball. I, I, I had never, I had never known that story, but it makes sense now uh, from the, from the, the KSO member that that's his uh, username on there. Yes. Uh, and uh, that makes that makes sense. I've heard the name before, and it gets brought up, and people laugh. And I'm like, I don't know what the, Mick, the Mickey was. Mantle and Joe DiMaggio signed baseballs. He stole from Bill Snyder's house. Wow, how about that? Uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty that's pretty impressive, right there. I mean, I I, I mean, I don't know, stealing them from your coach. That's a bold move. So <laughs> I. I was going to try and give him credit for like, well, maybe that was creative and a good like way to, you know, try and cover yourself up. I don't think it is. I think it's, it's, it's not typically okay. that's not what you want. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, last pick here to, to finish things off in the balance. I mean, the balance continues. This is a great, 
if you had to actually go out and play, Fan has a team that might be able to win, which is <laughs> something that a lot of the guys on this roster probably can't say because they didn't have many on-field accomplishments. Um, I'm going to go with my first wide receiver pick. Um, again, same. There was a lot of these guys from the early 2000s that I remembered. Um, uh, this one is wide receiver Jerome Jeanette, who uh, um, I think – Played a little bit. I think his one of his most famous moves was fumbling a punt return and a loss to Colorado in 2004, 2005 that set up a field goal from uh, the kicker that seemed to be at Colorado forever. And I think he kicked for the Broncos forever. Um, I can't remember his name, but he was a really good kicker. Um, but he was a, like a four or five star, ended up transferring to Tulsa, I think, after K-State. He was from Tulsa Union. Uh, Jerome Jeanette was, was one of the more hyped – Again, Snyder 1.0, late recruits that turned out not to pan out. So that's my final pick. I like it. I like it. That's another name that I've heard, but obviously uh, in the annals of K-State history, don't know that you find much on him uh, accomplishing things on the field. So it all makes sense uh, with how that goes down. Okay, uh, looking now, I've got my last pick here. I have some options that uh, I, I like. And this is where we could get into, you know, the hot take category. And I think I could win over a lot of people. I could juice the vote a little bit with my last pick if I went that way. Um, the tough part is, is that there are some guys on here that there wasn't a spring game to kind of springboard them. Because that's the thing with Jabaston Taylor is that he had like the spring game where he caught two touchdown passes and – uh and then, I'm ready to really blow it up on my last pick. So Okay. Well, I have two guys that I'm down to because I, I like to stir the pot and I like to get a little hot takey. Um, and I've I've been pretty vocal about one of these. Do I I mean I, I've got all these receivers. I better grab a quarterback <laughs> to throw to these guys. I'm gonna put Will Howard on here because he's the best oh. backup quarterback in the country. So I think <laughs> I think Will Howard has to be on this list, even though obviously uh, he accomplished a lot as a Big 12 champion quarterback, and we we know how it worked out. I think that there is there is a lot more buzz that was attached to him than ultimately what he ended up accomplishing. So I will put Will Howard on here. Oh, see, you really went for the the blow it up. I yeah. think that people are gonna be like fine with my pick now. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because I was gonna say the the probably the most memorable play from the Big Twelve Championship game is put R.J. Garcia on here. Guy, okay. uh, I was an R.J. Garcia guy. I'll I'll admit to it. Uh, but like he just didn't really do anything. It was best for both parties to move on. But like we kept hearing, even during his freshman season, that like he was coming, and then he had the one good game against SEMO last year, and then I don't think he caught a pass after that. Yeah, Simo, where uh, he he recovered a fumble. That was like his best catch of the season. Uh, was a ball that he picked up from one of his teammates dropping. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's a that's a good one. I think that's that's definitely one too, where the fan perspective was probably a lot greater than what the staff perspective was because. I don't know that like I remember just like a ton of like hype coming directly from the mouth of coaches, but that's one that there was some size. And then you think about, okay, he made that catch in the, the big 12 championship. It carried over to where people were like, yes, RJ Garcia. So uh, that's, that is a fine pick. You definitely could have stirred the pot a little bit more. Uh, we can get into before we break down these teams here and uh, pick our winners. I had on my big board left over, um, I had Al I had Alex Delton on there, mainly because of how I viewed Alex Delton. But also, let me uh, let me pull it up here. He was on my list too. Uh, I have I have a quote from somebody that uh, worked at KSO, and I just I just want this to be put out here. Uh, and it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> they said, "quote." Alex Delton might have been the best player for Kansas State in the spring game. Do we want to guess who said that? Uh, that that did or does currently work at KSO? Uh, I feel like, hmm, it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. 
And it, it wasn't the two of us. <laughs> who, who are you going to throw under the bus? It was Derek Young. He said that <laughs> in, a, in a story that... <laughs> that he wrote about uh about k-state football that was that that was a That's quote in there uh so i even, yeah even I, better that you did the research to find that <laughs> yeah. well i i may have gone uh i may have gone to rivals and searched alex delton just to see what was there uh but he was on there this is one I, I i i wasn't gonna put it because obviously we know that like injury played a part in this but mike mccoy would have been mm -hmm. one Mm -hmm. That would have fit the bill, but he doesn't deserve to be on a list with these bum wide receivers and guys that had a a lot of these guys. If we're being honest, for the most part, not the not the last two guys on my list, and not even Seabass, but some of the others. Like you look around, and as Fan said about a guy stealing baseballs from his coach, these guys had problems off the field that led to them not being very good on the field. Um, so Mike McCoy certainly doesn't deserve to be in this category. Uh, and then I also had leftover uh, Khalid Duke, which I think a lot of people are surprised maybe that I didn't take him because I've been pretty vocal about how underwhelmed I think Khalid Duke was because it seemed like many times we got a lot of Khalid Duke hype. And at the end of the day, he was, he was fine, had his moments, but he never really lived up to it. And really, I mean, he kind of got uh, his his hype spot taken by Felix Andy DK Uzama, who – obviously deserved it in the end um but I, I put khalid duke on there so any other honorable mentions from you guys i've got i've got a couple my my modern era climbing era pick would have been jake rubley just because he was a four star yeah, yeah that's like he was one. very hyped when we got him like we thought he was day, be... day after the liberty bowl yeah. i remember driving yeah. home and yeah and uh that was that was quite the time. Like, oh then, my god, it's four star. And then a couple other, and I think a lot of this was kind of the late two thousands or early two thousand. We got some sort of like Bill Snyder recruiting bump because um, there were several other guys like Daniel Davis was a JUCO running back that never did much. Uh, Matt Boss was a, a guy that played a, got recruited by Snyder, played under Print, uh, Ron Prince, and. There's some crazy stories about him and Ron Prince and Ron. I Prince have heard calling, those <laughs> calling him the P word in, in the team meeting. Um, and then Lamarck Brown was another one that was, Oh, um, was that's a great highly touted athlete. Tried to play running back at like six, four, six, five had one decent game. I think we drilled Texas A&M. Snyder's first year, maybe. And well, and Lamarck I, Brown had a good game. That's one that like, he, he I, was, didn't do much. I loved Lamarck Brown as a kid, but I was also like nine years old. So it was probably a little tough for me to match, you know, what's the expectation for this guy versus what he's doing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that that's, that's a good, that's a good name to throw out there. Uh, the, the one, the, probably the top one on my list that was still left is another kind of hairy one, like RJ Garcia, Will Howard, but Josh Youngblood. Cause mm. Mm -hmm. After his freshman season, just nothing, and then he left, and then he's yeah. left like two other schools. So obviously, it was a him problem. Well, I'll, I'll say this: I'm glad you didn't put him on your team because I would have had a pretty easy case to make against why you should not be voted for this week, and that would be the fact that he was good as a freshman in his role, and he was hurt that off season. We know this staying on Chris Kleiman's couch, basically. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, he was, COVID, yeah, yeah. I don't know that. Like, I don't. What do you want the guy to do? He can't do anything. He's he's trying to recover. So uh, no, that's that's a good name to to mention and throw out there. So uh, I I res I respect that move. Any other names that uh, can be thrown out that people might go? Oh, I remember that guy, or I should have picked him i'm sure there are going to be some people that have some good names to throw out there so one i saw that had a, a really good spring game that i don't ever know who even played judah jones was a running oh, back slash wide receiver yeah. that had a, had a really good spring game i looked up and i don't even know if he played a snap that i remember during what real action i don't think so but he was also amazing on ncaa football he was fast <laughs> yeah. So a little insight on what I did. I went and I was like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm just going to uh, to try and make sure I don't miss anybody. 
I'm going to go and try and find like old, like KSO spring game stuff. And so I found the one from 2018, which is in hindsight, a legendary spring game for how bad that team was that season. Uh, and so I found, I found Matt Hall's running diary from the game. And this isn't by no means like a shot at Matt for what is said in here, but I'm just going through and looking at names that get brought up. Um, I, I see, we see the, the tight end battle of tight end one between Nick Lenners and blaze Gammon, <laughs> which, uh, I mean, very, very few times does the tight end position battle give you some insight into what a team might be. But I think that that one, it might do it. Uh, I mean, that's just another one. What does Sammy Wheeler look like on the field? Um, I believe this may this may have been before Sammy Wheeler made the shift to quarterback, I can't, or to not to quarterback, but to tight end from quarterback. Um, so that's that's an interesting one. Let's see what else. Uh, if you want to know, here are the here are some of the visitors that were on hand for that game. Uh, Jaquavius Lane, <laughs> uh, Malik Knowles, KT Leviston, Christian Duffy. Uh, all these guys commits, by the way. Uh, nice. Cortez Crook Jones, uh, Shane Cherry, never heard of this guy before. Uh, uh, some two star offensive tackle from Missouri, uh, 6'5, 300. Uh, Taquilo Moore was in attendance. Jalen Pickle in the house. Uh, Echo Boydo was there making friends with uh, Miles Dickens, who ended up <laughs> signing with Georgia State. Um, let's see who else is on this list. Cooper Beebe there as well. This is a pretty and loaded spring game visitor list. Keenan Garber there. Mm. So a lot of guys. Uh, and some guy from Capen that ended up committing to Columbia. Uh, he was visiting for the spring game. So there you go. Uh, if you're curious, Dalton Reisner, Abdul Beecham, Eli Walker, Denzel Goolsby, Kendall Adams, Mike McCoy, and Daryl Patterson did not play in the spring game in 2018. <laughs> they were out. Uh, and listed as questionable, Scott France, A.J. Parker, uh, Mason Barta, Sam Sizelove, Ian Rudzik, D.J. Render, and Sammy Wheeler. Shout out to my guy, D.J. Render. We had a lot of classes together at K-State. Uh, nice guy. Um, we have a picture of Isaiah Zuber here. So just a fantastic player. NFL wide receiver, Isaiah Zuber. Uh, this is one where the the comments afterwards made me laugh about what uh, Bill Snyder had to say about it. Uh, Adam Harder was out there with the number ones at, at fullback. Snyder said, I thought Harder, he got more opportunity. He did well with his hands on the ball. We have growth to make at that position. Uh, I don't know. This is like a perfect reason why Bill Snyder had to be done after 2018. We're talking about Adam Harder at fullback doing good things with the ball in his hands. <laughs> no reason why the ball should have been in his hands uh, <laughs> like that. And that is not a shot at Adam Harder. I don't want anybody to get confused about that. That is a shot at a 2018 version of Bill Snyder. So uh, that those were kind of fun to go back and look at. And I, if the, the search function was better uh, on, on Rivals, I would love to go back and look at older spring game mm -hmm. recaps. Um, some stats from that 2018 game, Alex Delton. I mean, he may have been the best player on the field. DY was right. 21 of 28 for 206 yards and three touchdowns, no picks, uh, 19 yards on three carries, which that's like going for 200 in a spring game where it's touch football for the quarterbacks. Um, let's see. Seabass had five catches for 118 yards and two touchdowns. So that's reason enough for everybody to vote for me. And you know what? <laughs> Maybe Bill was right. Adam Harder, seven catches, 60 yards, and a touchdown. So that's that's on me. Uh, Brock Monty led the team in tackles with 14. So there, there is your 2018 K-State football spring game recap. 14 uh, tackles in a spring game is ludicrous. It's pretty yeah, good. That's <laughs> did he do it for all there. one team, or did he play on both teams? I hope he played for both. <laughs> he, they probably had him out there just rolling with, hey, we, we don't have enough. You got to go ones and twos today. So that's – uh. It may it may have been a fun exercise that with all these spring games going on, if we could find an old spring game to watch, uh, if we did like a live watch with it and that just kind of skip cool. around. Fun. Fun. And and I would prefer it to be from like a bad team. So like 2015 or 2018 uh, would have been pretty fun. Or like a Prince team. Like I bet a <laughs> Prince spring game would be electric because there are a ton of guys that would have made it to town 
uh, under Ron Prince that you would probably laugh at seeing. So, and if I remember I, right, at least at least once Prince did the draft. Like, yeah, two guys and the the two guys got to pick their teams. It was love it. It was fun. I, or the coaches did. I can't remember. It was, but he did the draft teams. I think Texas Tech is doing that this year. That seems like a Joey McGuire thing, which Joey McGuire might be a less verbally abusive Ron Prince if we start <laughs> to think about it. So the jury is still very much out on uh, on what he's going to do there. So, uh, all right, real quick before we, we finish up then, uh, who do you guys like as, uh, as the winner of this draft? I'll throw it back up there one last time. Again, you can't vote for yourself, so basically you're just picking out of two guys who you think won this thing. Uh, but give your picks. Uh, I like fans team. I, Bryce Brown in the second. That that was a, that was a good pick. Yeah, and, and uh, the Chris Bogus story, hilarious. Yeah, yeah I don't know that you can <laughs> beat a guy not. stealing balls from his coach. <laughs> That's the reason not for me. Uh, I I they're both good. Re, both of your teams are really good, but Drew's with Hunter Rice and John Holcomb <laughs> to lead it. Like I love the the. the Strickland and Taylor are both on par for what we're doing here, but Ryzen and Holcomb, man, that's and even Samuel Lemur's throw it in there. That's tough to beat. Yeah, I th- I I go with Drew just for the sheer shock factor of his <laughs> list. Uh, I think people are going to look at that and they're going to just laugh to themselves that they're like, "Oh man, I can't believe we like trusted putting hype into Hunter Ryzen and John Holcomb." Uh, to be fair, Hunter Ryzen probably was pretty good. Yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> we're going to be able to find that out on the field. Issues. So, a few issues. Uh yeah, that's that's a that's a that's, that's a good list. And then I think there are going to be a lot of people like me too that they like Samuel Lemur. So they they like that name being thrown out there. Um yeah, I mean, yeah. look, I I think if you're looking at this list in a realistic point of view, I think I put together a very strong team, but I do think that I mean, Drew went up there and got some guys with some character concerns, and it's going to pay off for him, you know? like I, I'm interested to see this vote because I think this vote's going to be really close. Yeah, uh, that's... I mean, and I got to give Drew the, the Hunter Ryzen, you know, his his dad did have his house burned down by a, a <laughs> member of TLC, his which was his girlfriend at the time. So there was maybe some traumatic childhood issues there as well man yeah <laughs> also uh hunter risen's dad was in the uh broke 30 for 30 so yes, yes. Know, probably not probably that. not much going around early on in hunter's life uh man yeah what what a list there we'll we'll get that up on twitter and uh on the boards as well drew won it with like 48 percent of the vote i think uh on twitter i needed to go back and see what he actually ended up doing on the board to see if maybe that was weighted any different way but it was pretty close on the board if i remember right okay yeah i i was just i i was impressed by the way that uh it it turned out for i mean i knew drew was going to win it but yeah. that was that was a good was i a didn't good come to f around last week <laughs> no and that's good i don't i don't i don't want you taking this lightly this is something that you got to take serious all the time um let's see okay here we go the vote uh, the vote was a lot closer on KSO. Uh, Drew was down to 41%, and then Fan was over almost 33%, and I was Ooh. at 26 So uh, I, the, the ball knowers of KSO, not the general True. population on True. Twitter, uh, they, they saw things a little bit differently. So uh, just know that I'll respect your opinion more if you vote on KSO. And uh, if we're being honest here, you can just vote twice, both on Twitter and KSO, so you can kind of juice the the ballots there. Uh, but Drew, the undisputed winner of the first draft, and it seems like he might be on his way to winning again. So I respect your opinion if you vote on Twitter, not because I won by more, but just for other reasons. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what, what those reasons might be. Uh, Drew can elaborate some other time for everybody. But that will do it for us. I am probably going to get my butt whooped. I told my wife we would be quicker today. And it'd be like, I said, there's no way we get to more than 45 minutes out of this. We did. uh, So I'm out of here and uh, hope everybody gets to enjoy the rest of their Sunday because I may not.